All right, folks, thanks very much for joining um, my session today, Deploying Fury at Scale. My name is Sasha. I'm from Australia um, a while ago, but uh, for the last few years, I've been living in Singapore and working on an implementation project for an S4HANA Greenfield implementation with Fury. And that's what I wanted to talk about today, some of the lessons that we learned uh, rolling this stuff out for a global company with users all around the world. Um, Got a few slides, so I'll just get cracking uh, without much intro. All right, just a little bit for background. Um, this is an implementation for a company called Orica, uh, not Oracle, but Orica. Uh, they make explosives. They're the biggest ma explosives manufacturer in the world. They're a fairly global company as well, so I've just brought up this map here as a bit of um, a visual help. Um, Orica operate in 57 countries, uh, and they've got uh, manufacturing facilities and distribution centers and offices in, in all of those countries. Um, what you're seeing here are the different logistics connections between those places. Something might be manufactured in one place, sent to another place, assembled with something else together, and then shipped and sold to a customer. So it's a fairly global organization with uh, a presence in quite a lot of different countries and also a fairly global workforce, right? So people scattered in many different countries, often working for uh, mine sites, uh, quarrying companies, tunneling uh, projects and so on. So typically not based in large cities and urban centers, but um, out in, in areas where internet connections is maybe not the greatest. Uh, so those blue circles are all the locations that Orica folks are based at. Now, the project as a whole uh, is a greenfield build. So the, the company has been using SAP for uh, a really, really long time. Uh, if you look at the Wikipedia page for SAP, um, you'll see that the first ever customer SAP had was the German subsidiary uh, of um, ICI, International Chemical Industries, which was a forerunner of Orica. So it's, a, its involvement with SAP is a really, really long time ago. Um, but this is a greenfield implementation. So the company decided that the ECC system they've had for quite a long time now um, yeah, wasn't really fit for purpose anymore with how the company has evolved and how it's changed. So they wanted to go uh, greenfields on S4HANA with eight end-to-end -end business processes. So I won't go too much into this, but just to note that the program that I've been working on for the last few years um, has been primarily a business-led and business-run initiative around business process re-engineering, aligning the company for a common set of business processes around the world. In terms of architecture, this is the kind of architecture we show to the board of directors, right? They can see lots of clouds, they can see lots of different products that they might be familiar with. Um, and then s in the middle that has some integrations to it from the, those different cloud products. Um, but we're technology folks here, this is a technology type of online conference. So let's have a look at the detail. All right, I, I won't dive into this. This is just basically a slide to scare people. Um, it shows lots of different uh, interfaces between all the different components that you need to make that very simple cloud picture work in, in the real world. Um, there's obviously a lot of moving parts to this, but I won't really go into that and bore you with this. Now, from a business perspective, the company had a few different things they wanted to achieve with this kind of sizable project, right? Um, right now, the company runs SAP, but in some markets and in some countries, uh, they have non-SAP ERP systems. So they wanted to get rid of all of those and consolidate on one SAP system. Um, they wanted to implement consistent processes across the world so that everybody does the same thing in the same way across all those different countries and also have quality master data for that. So basically everybody measures things the same way. If, if the same product is used in multiple different geographies, then the same material master is used in all of those different geographies. Um, if we're measuring overall equipment efficiency, then we want to use the same formula in all of the different markets rather than one country doing things in a different way and therefore the company overall not having that visibility anymore to be able to measure things and compare things. Um, so there's a few things here that you know the business wanted to achieve and the choice of technology was kind of not really important for that but from a technology perspective we had a a smaller set of vision statements but one that was i think pretty important to the company and to us and and 
I'll talk to this in this talk. And this is really anywhere, any device productivity. So with such a diverse distributed workforce um, in so many different countries working on um, mine sites that you know, Orica doesn't own and may not own a lot of infrastructure at, this was, became pretty important. The ability for our staff to be able to use the SAP systems wherever they were without necessarily having to be at an Orica location with a network and a VPN and all of these sort of things. And this really drove a lot of the work that um, I'll talk about in this talk and some of the challenges that we faced as well. And what that meant really is that we couldn't rely on SAP GUI anymore, right? Because SAP GUI uh, means you now need to have a managed laptop with a SAP GUI installation and the config files and all of that stuff. It's not really any device anywhere anymore. So we had to really look for ways to get out of SAP GUI. And the way we we're hoping to do that was by using Fiori. For a number of years, SAP strategy has been towards to going to, SA to Fiori uh, and all of the software as a service applications that we were using, you know, SuccessFactors, Concur, Ariba, and so on, they were anyways all browser-based. So it made a lot of sense for us. But how do we do that? So I'll cover some of the things from the bottom of the technology stack to the top of the stack, and just to see all of the different um, decision points and, and things we had to do in order to get to a point where uh, we're, we're about to go live uh, with a, a big Fiori deployment for that big workforce uh, for hundreds of different job profiles. Okay, let's start at the bottom. So the overall architecture at the beginning of the project, you want to get that right. So you want to understand what systems do I need? How do I architect them? What components do I need? Where do I put them and so on? So our technology stack uh, is kind of traditional on-premises versions of the software. So we're not using S4HANA Cloud, um, but we are running it all in Azure infrastructure as a service, basically. Um, so you see in the bottom here, we're running everything on HANA. So our principle was that anything that could run on HANA would run on HANA. Um, we have an S4HANA 1809 system. Uh, we have some satellite sidecar systems, if you like for uh, payroll and uh, GTS and event management, things that can't yet run on S4HANA. Um, we have a front-end server across the top of it, so we're using this kind of hub-and-spoke architecture and then a web dispatcher on top. Um, if we were to do it again, maybe we don't need the front-end server anymore. You know, SAP's guidance has gone away from that a little bit and um, is now favoring a, com a combined deployment with S4HANA, but it's a bit of horses for courses for us. We needed to have the front-end server in place because we went live with some of the satellite systems first. So we needed to have a front-end server before S4HANA was there. But you know, it depends on your specific company and your, um, your requirements. But one thing you have to really be mindful of is that you, you do have to allow for time to plan this, um, time to think through the different pros and cons of the different options try to understand the options and try to weigh up which are actually the most suitable for your particular context. You know, are you going greenfield or brownfield? That will probably determine or have some determining effect on um, how many systems you're deploying or what kind of deployment architecture you're using. You know, what scalability do you need? Uh, these are all questions you have to address based on your specific needs, um, but do allow time for that. So we, we were lucky on this project that we had uh, a good nine months upfront to build a business case to do some planning and, and um, thinking time before it came to implementing time. And that was really very necessary because it laid some of the groundwork that then allowed us to actually go and execute this. So it definitely takes time. And uh, if you're starting from scratch, it probably takes a few months to get all of those decisions nailed down. So do make sure that you cater for that. Um, location. Location is an important one too, right? Because it affects um, the user's experience, but also has some legal impacts, for example, as to um, data residency, where the data is residing. Many different decision factors come into this. So uh, I've listed the major ones that we thought through, and one of those was uh, the availability of SaaS applications. So we're using almost all of the major SaaS applications from SAP. And not every one of those is available in every jurisdiction. So while Orica is uh, headquartered in Australia, I, I can get an Australian success factors instance, that's okay. 
but I can't get an Australian resident Ariba instance, for example, um, you know, or, or IBP. Uh, so there's different constraints for different software as a service applications. And back when we were doing this in, in 2016, 2017, there were really only two geographies that had the full breadth of SAP products available. That's the EU and the US. We then looked at infrastructure as a service feature availability as well, because we're running HANA. HANA is quite particular with the different hardware options that it supports and that SAP certifies. So we have to take that into consideration. Where are the specific VM types that HANA requires available in which jurisdiction? Um, then there's some legal and privacy implications. Right? If you put your service in a particular jurisdiction, does that mean that you now have to comply with a, a bunch of other government regulations or that there are some unforeseen consequences in terms of privacy and, and, and um, data protection? Uh, network connectivity was another important one for us with such a global dispersed workforce. Uh, if we put the systems in Europe so that they're all close to all the other software as a service applications, what's the user experience going to be like for people in South America? And we found that it actually was going to be pretty bad. Um, and then costs, right? Different jurisdictions have different pricing points, even for infrastructure as a service. Um, so the ones at the top change a little bit and they're very company specific, but I'll dive into the, the two points at the bottom a little bit more. So network bandwidth. There's a company called Telegeography, uh, which I'd highly recommend you guys to Google if you ever doing this sort of work here. They produce research about the network bandwidth and network costs uh, in different ge geographies and the connectivity qualities between those. Um, so you can see here that the, that the US is by far the most well-connected region globally. Um, Europe is, is pretty good, but you know, if you're a global company, then putting your systems uh, in maybe Oceania is not such a great idea because those links from Oceania to the rest of the world are pretty skinny and, and, and few. Uh, if you put your systems in the US, then you have pretty fat pipes to almost anywhere else in the world. Um, and cost as well. So there's some research, uh, especially in the infrastructure as a service space, there's quite a lot of research available around the different cost comparisons of different geographies. And I've highlighted here in orange where um, maybe the natural choice would have been to put systems in Australia as an Australian head office company. Um, and then we ended up going to the US actually, which are those two bars in the green, uh, which are you know a good um, maybe 10%, 12% lower um, than, they, than they could have been. So you know, lots of different considerations to take into account um, before you even start building any systems. The next thing I wanna to touch on is HTTP2. It's something I've talked about a number of times. Um, HTTP2 is the new version of the HTTP protocol. And when we're talking about Fury applications, web browser-based applications, we're talking HTTP. Now, HTTP2 has a few different uh, benefits over the, you know, the old HTTP from the 80s or 90s. Um, and I've listed some of those here. Um, you know, binary transfers, for example, means they're much more efficient than text-based formats. There's better compression for this. Um, there's inherent support for encryption. And multiplexing is probably the most important thing here. So on the left-hand side, you'll see the HTTP 1.1 uh, connections. One request gets made, the response gets sent. Only when the response is received does the next request get sent. So it's this ping pong, ping pong, ping pong scenario. Um, Usually, if you're sitting in an office and you're right next to the server, you don't notice the difference. But in, in our, our situation, where we had people spread in so many different countries around the world, often with very poor network connectivity, sometimes with satellite connectivity only, the latency of each of those request response pings becomes pretty high. So if I have to process them in sequence, the overall length of time that passes gets much, much longer. HTTP2 um, solves this a little bit through multiplexing. So on the right-hand side, you'll see that multiple different requests can be sent before the first response has even been received. So you're saving on overall duration of a particular HTTP um, exchange, i.e. a different website loading. 
with Fiori, sometimes you have over 100 different HTTP requests that are required to build up a Fiori app or to build up a Fiori launchpad. So saving a few dozens or a few hundred milliseconds times 100, all of a sudden it adds up to some pretty important considerations. Um, OK, so that's the, the basic here of, of this multiplexing. Um, now, fortunately for us, uh, this is pretty easy, and it, it recently got even easier with the very latest versions of the SAP kernel web dispatcher. This is already enabled by default. If you're not on those yet, all you have to do is set this one ICM parameter uh, and restart the ICM, and that's it. So if you have a web dispatcher, you set that parameter on the web dispatcher, and that's all you have to do to enable it. Um, that is if you already have SSL support. So HTTP2, like a lot of the modern uh, browser protocols, make SSL encryption mandatory. So you have to have an SSL certificate-based setup uh, that works, and um, that's already been deployed in your SAP environments. And if you have that, then you just have to have to set that one parameter. Um, now, there's a slightly more advanced flavor of this. Um, it requires a second parameter, and that now means that there's a HTTP2 connection between the web dispatcher and your ABAP systems as well, um, just for maybe a little bit of additional performance improvements. But the first one here is, is the main uh, thing you have to do. There's a blog post here, so if you look through the slides, um, then you'll follow the link in the, in the slide and you get to a blog post that shows you a little bit more detail about this. But considering that it's just a one parameter change, um, it's, it's fairly simple to do and it has quite a big payoff. So in our case, when we started, we had installed front-end server and Fury Launchpad and it took about 18 seconds to load the Fury Launchpad. Just setting that one parameter shaved four seconds of the load time of the Fury Launchpad. So it's a 20% reduction in, in load time, 20% you know, improvement in user perceived speed for the cost of one parameter. So that's, that's pretty good, worthwhile to do. The other thing we started to do is to implement the UI5 CDN, the Content Distribution Network. So this is an initiative that SAP actually provides for free to its customers, which doesn't happen often, so you better take advantage of it. Uh, it's a collaboration between SAP and Akamai. Um, Akamai own content delivery networks around the world. And basically what it means is that um, it, every of these Akamai edge locations scattered around the world is a complete copy of the UI5 framework. All the JavaScript libraries, the CSS files, uh, of very, many, many different types of versions. So the benefit of that is when you overlay that with our user population, you'll see that our users are also in many different parts of the world. Um, and the benefit of that is that rather than me sitting in Singapore, having to go all the way across the Pacific to the US to fetch UI5 resources and then bring them back and then fetch the next one and bring it back, and each time incur that 200 millisecond latency across the Pacific. Um, instead of doing that, I can just go to the local Akamai server node in Singapore, which is uh, usually less than 20 milliseconds of latency away. So it's a, a factor 10 improvement in the latency to fetch all of the different JavaScript files and, and CSS files that come with the UI5 library. And then only OData calls and language translation files and other property files that are customer specific, they come from the s environment and they don't get served from the CDN. Um, but it does depend again a little bit on your particulars in, in your organization. So for example, you know, where are your users relative to your internet access points relative to your server? If your company is just based in one office, in one building and in the basement you've got your SAP servers and on the floors above you have your users then most likely going out to the internet and fetching things from the internet is not going to be any faster. Um, you know it depends do you have enough internet bandwidth is that congested do you have a proxy that's really overloaded and, and struggling in some of those scenarios it may not actually be any faster to implement a CDN but in some scenarios it may be faster. So a little bit of testing probably goes a long way, and it's a very small change. It's a very simple change to do, 
again, you have a look through the slide packs, there are some links that um, describe how that can be enabled on the front end server, and that's all you have to do. Now, if you look at our experience, what we've measured, um, when, when I load Fury Launchpad for my user, roughly half the requests, the ones in orange on the left-hand side, uh, are served by the content delivery network. And roughly half of the requests come from the front-end server. So you know, again, things like uh, role menus, translations, configurations, kind of system-specific stuff comes from the front-end server. But in terms of the weight of the Fury Launchpad, the, the three megabytes of content that's required to render the Fury Launchpad, uh, what is it, 80% of that, the orange slice on the right, uh, comes from the internet. So it's not actually generating traffic from SAP environments at all. It's not generating traffic for the Azure data center. Um, it's all being served by Akamai. And then only the 550 kilobytes, the things that actually company specific or user specific, they come from the SAP systems. So it helps you save on uh, the hardware capacity you need as well. Um, and again, we measured some performance gains. So now we got down to 11 seconds for loading the front Fury Launchpad. Previously it was 18. We effectively changed two parameters and we reduced seven seconds of load time. Um, so I think that's, you know, if, if you're rolling out Fury Launchpad, have a look at those things and see if they're already active in your environments. Uh, the, the payback, the return on investment is, is pretty high for this stuff. Okay, maybe going a little bit further up the stack now, um, you, you may also come across something like Riverbed WAN optimization. So this was something that Orica already had when, when we started this, um, but we expanded on it. So what Riverbed does is, yeah, it's basically some black magic in between your, your office um, environment, your, where your users are, and your data center where your servers are. Uh, so you put some Riverbed devices either side, um, and then they, they do some traffic optimization and compression and lots of other fancy stuff in between to kind of speed things up. Um, it's, it is a bit of black magic, so uh, it's a little bit difficult to exactly understand how it works. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But in our case, we saw that sometimes it made a positive difference. So if I look at uh, one week, so this is pre-COVID because the office has all been in lockdown, <laughs> um, but pre-COVID, pre about one week's worth of traffic from the Singapore office, um, there's about 500 gigabytes of traffic. And you'll see here on the stats that 500 gigabytes got compressed down to about 300 across the WAN. Uh, so there's like a 46% reduction just by having this riverbed thing in place. And um, you know that's now all 270 something gigabytes that don't have to traverse your expensive global network uh, and don't have to hit your, your data center network potentially. Now, when you dig into this a little bit more, um, as I mentioned before, everything Fury has to be SSL encrypted. So the line item for SSL uh, reduction is actually pretty meager. It's only like 5%, so it's hardly really worth it. Um, there's not much benefit that you can achieve in terms of data compression for things like Fury traffic and, and lots of other web applications. But um, this is the party piece here. Things like SMB3 and SMB2, things like file sharing traffic uh, for network shares or um, SharePoint file shares, there's a massive reduction in that. You know, see up to 97% of traffic reduction. So what that means is if you're sending um, a, a big PowerPoint presentation to somebody, on SharePoint and uh, everybody that opens that in the office, um, the first person who opens it has to fetch it from SharePoint, but then the subsequent people that open the same file, that local device that sits in your office has that traffic cached and can serve that without having to go across the network again. So what that does is it really frees up some of your pipes for some of the more important traffic. Uh, people sharing big um, zip files of, you know, photos from the Christmas party, uh, that, that doesn't clog up the network anymore now. It's, uh, it can be optimized, and therefore create room for your Fury applications where you struggle to optimize them a little bit more. Okay, um, so that's some of the basic stuff. Now let's have a look at the access from anywhere. From a technology perspective, uh, how did we do that? 
So why it was important for us is that uh, we have about 400 different customer sites, um, which is basically locations that aren't owned by Orica, but they have over three and a half thousand Orica employees working there. That makes it pretty difficult to put networking equipment in for the, the, the private Orica network, right? It makes it difficult to put a switch in and all of this because these aren't our sites, they're not our data centers. And from this graph here, you'll see that a lot of uh, sites have very few people working at them. Um, you know, there's over 150 that only have five people working at them from Orica. Um, there's about 100 sites that have fewer than 10 people working there. So if I only have five employees on the site, it doesn't really make sense to put tens of thousands of dollars of networking equipment into that location, especially if I don't own it. And a year or two from now, you know, we might lose that contract and then we have to take it all out again. So it's very difficult to do technology investments in those locations when there's no long-term uh, ownership of those places. So, and coming back, no more SAP GUI. So what we really need to focus on now is the browser to make that happen. Okay, so from a technology perspective, we already know we we're running in Azure. So we had to look at what functionality does Azure offer to help make this happen. And there's this thing called the Azure Application Proxy, which is basically a reverse proxy for being able to publish web-based applications out to the internet um, through a reverse proxy. And uh, Azure, it's an Azure service, and Azure looks after all of the security uh, aspects of this. So there is um, authentication, encryption, multi-factor uh, auth access protection here. Um, there is a level of um, you know, DDoS prevention and a level of security scanning of the traffic. And it's using Azure's internet link. It's not using your own private uh, internet access point in the data center. It's using Azure's bandwidth, which is probably much, much bigger than what you have in your own company. Um, and it's pretty cheap. It's like $300 a month. Uh, so it's, it's hardly any money at all. How that looks like is it's a, an Azure presented web page, microsoftonline.com. I type in my credentials, I get prompted for MFA, and I'm exposed um, into my Fiori Launchpad and um, GUI for HTML and, and all the other browser based applications that are running in Azure. Uh, so, simple. Um, another thing to look out for is, is software currency. So, Really, that means just keeping your software up to date as well. So the, our project's been going for a little while now. It's been going for a few years. Uh, we've had a few different upgrades along the way, and we've tried to keep as best we can uh, on the most recent versions of the software. And we found that there were some significant performance improvements in front-end server version 5. Now, version 6 is out now at the moment, uh, but, so we're still on 5. Um, so we did see some, some significant performance improvements that made it worthwhile upgrading and doing some regression testing for this. Um, so for example, we implemented stateful application containers, which meant that uh, GUI for HTML screens opened within the Fiori launchpad um, in place within the browser tab, rather than opening up a second browser tab. Um, that helps performance quite a bit because it means that the browser doesn't have to re-render and re-execute all this JavaScript again, just to paint the outlines of the frame. Um, and also generating your launchpad, your initial role setup, all the different tiles, that was much faster as well. So those two things combined already gave us another 25% improvement. So we got down to eight seconds for loading our Fiori launchpad. Um, we started off on 18. So you know, it's, a, it's a very big reduction in load time and improvement uh, for performance without really a lot of heavy lifting and understanding the ins and outs of the code. It was just a couple of parameters and keeping your code up to date. And the other thing we did was um, to look at Google Analytics because you need to see what people are using, who they are, where they're coming from, what devices they're using, so you don't fly completely blind. Uh, so we deployed Google Analytics in Fiori Launchpad. There's a blog post linked here that shows you how to do it. And, um, and then you'll see basically which apps 
are the most popular, where they're used, where the people are that are using them, uh, what devices they're using and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so that gives you, you know, again, for very, very little investment in time and no investment in money, it gives you a good amount of insight. Okay, so that's all the easy stuff. Now, the difficult stuff. Um, I'll talk a little, bit, a little bit about the scope and then some of the, the higher order things we did in order to be able to deploy our Fury launchpad to such a big workforce for a very big process scope. Okay, talking about scope first. So we have over 1400 tiles that we're deploying to users. Um, it's quite a lot because Fiori is our primary user interface, right? So we want everybody to go to Fiori Launchpad first and then navigate within the Fiori Launchpad, sometimes break out to other software as a service applications, but generally it's a browser first UI. Um, so 1400 Fiori tiles, uh, just over 550 of those, uh, sorry, 450 of those are genuine Fiori applications with the UI5 framework. Um, so you'll see on the right hand side here, the biggest chunk of that um, is GUI for HTML because unfortunately still in 1809, a lot of the UI functionality is delivered as GUI transactions um, in a web context uh, with GUI for HTML. Um, the next biggest component is genuine UI5, then there's some WebDim Pro, a bunch of analytics stuff. Um, and then in green down here, we have uh, URL links for other SaaS applications. So breakout points to go to success factors or to go to Concur. And then we have 12 transactions um, that have to be done using NWBC for Windows. So a fat client, they're for various reasons and not compatible with GUI for HTML. Um, and out of all of those, there is, 75 custom Fiori apps that we built for specific functionality that SAP didn't have available and we had to custom build uh, applications for those. Okay, so that's the scope. Um, now we have to think about the effort of doing this and then doing this deployment. So typically you'd start off by activating all of the standard apps. And when we started a couple of years ago, um, the, the rapid activation wasn't really 100% reliable and solid. Um, it got a lot better since we started this, but when we started back in the 1610 and 1709 days, there were quite a lot of rough edges. So we vastly underestimated that effort to begin with. We thought it was a, a matter of just, you know, next, 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 finish, kind of wizard-based activation, and, and that would be pretty simple. But in the end, we actually had a team of four people uh, whose job was just to activate apps and troubleshoot them and raise incidents with SAP and work with functional consultants to understand whether they really worked or not, to make sure the semantic object navigation was working, to make sure the user parameters were set up and so on. So it was actually quite a lot of effort for this. Um, we, we raised about 180 different SAP incidents for the different apps for, for bugs or for uh, things that weren't working correctly. And overall, over the whole, um, you know, probably nine months or so, the cadence we got through was about 3.5 apps per person per day, activated, troubleshot, tested, and, and good to go. So it, it was a non-zero amount of effort, ultimately. Yeah? That was something that we weren't prepared for. And it's definitely a learning uh, for, for the next one. So hopefully the rapid content activation will make this a little bit better and it'll keep improving over time. Uh, but in our case, it was a significant amount of effort to begin with. So in terms of the team structure, we actually had uh, four basis consultants who were more or less full-time on this for, for quite some time. Uh, they were people that had some prior experience with Fiori activations and Fiori troubleshooting and so on. And um, that's where we sourced them from. But then ultimately, once the activation was done, it really becomes much more about a security. So we started shifting the org structure a little bit and getting them to report more to the security folks. Because obviously, your Fiori launchpad menu is security role driven. And it needs to align with the security roles you have in the back end. Otherwise, your OData calls won't work. 
so it's it's much more important to keep that in alignment so hence we shifted the org structure a little bit um, if i was to do that again i think we'd start off with having um, you know some developers or, or basis background people actually reporting into the security teams to begin with um, but after all of that's done everything is great right so then we'll have a beautiful fury ui and everyone will love using sap yeah no. so what you end up with is really something like this right so you have a, a fury launch pad that's just got tiles all over the place without really any uh, semblance and, and organizational paradigm um, so to me this always looks like the, the bathroom wall like for me this is like you come into a bathroom and you just see tiles everywhere and it's very disorienting there's no organizing principle and structure to this so we needed to find a way of organizing this now best practice is to use design thinking yeah you go and empathize with your users you do that by running workshops by sitting down with them by understanding how they work what they need to do their, their job, what information do they need, what tasks do they need to perform, and you ideate, prototype, and iterate over that uh, until you get to a product that actually really meets what your users need uh, rather than what they say they need, but what they actually need. So this is kind of the, the, the design thinking process that I've stolen here from the D school, the, the Hasso Plattner Design Thinking School. In, in our case, this wasn't really practical um, because we have one go live. So we have a, a big bang go live uh, at one point in time for all of those 57 countries. Um, even after we simplified and standardized the org structure to reduce the number of jobs that people had in the organization, uh, we went from over a thousand different jobs in the HR org structure down to 630 jobs. Now, Nobody can do design thinking for 630 different personas of users in 57 countries speaking six different languages and so on. Um, the, the amount of effort for that is, is enormous. So we needed something that was a bit more like a machine, a bit more like an automated process that got to an outcome that was good enough to be able to go live with, with such a large number of user personas. Uh, and it didn't consume more effort than the rest of the project put together, basically. So we needed to come up with a way of automating this. Uh, luckily, we'd already invested quite a lot of time in business process management and uh, business process modeling specifically. So we're able to use that as the foundation for our you know, sausage factory automation of the Fury deployments. So just a little sidestep on the business process modeling. Um, you start with this top-down process decomposition. So you say, okay, at the very top, what is my value chain? Yeah? Buy things, make things, sell them. That kind of high-level value chain. And then you try and break that down into ever smaller pieces of business process, more fine-grained business process, until you get to the individual steps that people do, the individual tasks and the applications and transactions and, and Fury tiles that they use for those individual steps. So we start with value chains, high level stuff, and then we start drilling down. When you get to that fourth layer, this is like a process model that people would recognize. Boxes, decision steps, swim lanes to indicate who performs what roles, um, and then the individual process steps at the bottom, which are the individual tasks. And we modeled this all in Solution Manager. So Solution Manager allows you to do business process modeling. Um, we modeled the individual process steps and assigned to the process steps the Fury applications and, and transactions that are used to carry out that step. So you'll see that on the bottom left here, where we're saying, okay, in, in order to carry out the step, carry forward the GL balances, I need to use a Fury app and I need to use a transaction. So we modeled all of this in Solution Manager anyway as part of this business process reengineering project. So we thought, well, why can't we use that? We have, from those application executables, we have the links to the Fury app IDs, the semantic objects, and so on. So we have that captured already in Solution Manager. And we have quite a lot of this stuff. So when you look at the very top of the pyramid, there's only eight of these value chain diagrams because we have eight business processes like us, you know, had on slide three early on. 
But then when you go all the way down the pyramid, you've over 4,000 different process steps in those process models. And there's almost 500 process models, each with swim lanes and with, with steps assigned. So we have all of this vast library of stuff. Let's see how we can use that for building our Fury roles and, and not ending up with this bathroom wall kind of tile view. Okay, so one thing we needed to do here to connect the HR world and success factors with the solution manager process world. <clears throat> so as you've seen here in solution manager, we have swim lane roles for the process models. And then we have the linkages to the Fiori apps. And then success factors, we obviously know the people and what jobs they're in and their managers and their org structure and so on. We, we were missing that link in the middle between those. So this was a bit of custom development, which ended up being a, a custom built report that allows us to join that up together. So you take the process models and the org structure, um, combine that together, and then you know, okay, Sasha is in a particular job, and this job is mapped to a number of swim lane roles from the process models. Each swim lane role has steps. Each step has Fiori applications and transactions. So therefore, I can determine, well, what transactions does Sasha need to do his job? Um, and from that, you build your authorization roles. And from your authorization roles, you build your Fury Launchpad content so that you only see tiles that you actually have the access rights to execute and to use. And, and you don't see things that you're not authorized to use. Um, so this is the design we were targeting then. So um, forget about the numbers, the, the, they're just development system rubbish data. Um, so you, across the top, you'll see a number of tabs so that I don't have a whole screen full of tiles as soon as I log in, but I have just a few tabs across the top. Then I have my tiles. The first bit of tiles, um, so, yeah, these are the, the level two processes across the top for the tabs. Um, so these tabs correspond to the, the process decompositions so that hopefully the users can find some sort of logical way of, of organizing these tiles. Um, then at the beginning, we have our KPI tiles. So things that kind of quickly show user how a process is going or how, you know, how many items do I have in my inbox? How many purchase orders do I have to approve? How many invoices do I have to match to purchase orders? These kind of KPI tiles. And then transactional apps come after that and they're sorted alphabetically so that I can hopefully find them more quickly. Um, one slight snag with this is that um, in Fury, you can only sort um, one way regardless of language. So it so happens that our tiles are alphabetically sorted in English. Uh, but if I, I was a Russian speaker and I look at my tiles in Russian, Russian being one of the languages that we support in Fury, then the, the sorting may not be right anymore. Um, and unfortunately, there's, there's no way around that. That's just how it is. But at least in English, it's sorted. Um, and then tiles that are display only, that might provide some additional contextual information for people, but that they don't uh, allow change, are just links at the bottom, just to not take up so much space on the screen. So then we ended up with uh, roughly 38 catalogs and 38 groups, because we have 38 of those um, level two buckets. Uh, and then we have individual target mappings in the front end server for each individual job. So yeah, basically yeah, each tab is its own catalog and its own group. And then the target mapping defines which job has access to which tiles. Um, so then that's job specific and there's one of these for every job. So 630 of those. Um, and then you have to iterate this a little bit, right? Because even with that approach, you'll still end up with smaller bathroom tile walls but you, you still get some of those. So the first time we ran that, we said, oh, this works great, but there are some exceptions. We had a few different tabs that just contain way too much stuff. 
like this one. Uh, so now, then we have to manually go through here and now find, well, let's have a look at those apps. Are there commonalities that bind some of these together uh, and that make them different from other tiles? And, and this requires a little bit of you know, functional consultant input and so on. And then we found that in some cases there were still groups, subgroups that belonged together. So in this case, portfolio management, um, and that they were a little bit different from the other tiles on that. And then we separated that out and, and created another tab that just wasn't aligned to the processes, but so what, right? At least it's another organizational principle that makes sense. And we were always aiming to have no more than about 20 tiles per tab in, in our design. And, and on the, in the whole, we got there as well. Um, and then we encourage people to use the app finder whenever possible so that some apps that may not be super important to the user, but they're still entitled to use the apps. Uh, some of those we may not actually put on the launch pad at all. And we just leave them in the catalog for users to find using the app finder. Uh, so these are still transactions that they're authorized to run, but they won't be the necessarily the most important ones uh, for the user on a day-to-day -day basis. And for those, we use the app finder. And then this is kind of what we end up with. So um, what I'm showing here is the default launch pad for a senior manager logistics. So that's a specific job in the organization. You'll see that they have about 20 different tabs um, in their the tab list. And then each tab has somewhere from a handful to about 15, 20 tiles. Most jobs have in the order of 120 to 150 tiles that they have access to. Uh, some jobs have over 200, uh, but there's only a few. Uh, but the vast majority of jobs have in the order of um, 100 to 150 different uh, tiles on their launch pad. And then each job is yeah, specific to what they uh, that job is authorized to do. OK, even then, a couple of other lessons we learned here. So um, one thing that we did decide fairly early on was to stay standard with the launch pad. So we chose Belize Light, um, not necessarily my personal favorite, I like Belize Dark, but Belize Light is at least supported across most of the different SaaS applications. So not every software as a service application supports um, you know, a nice Fury look and feel, but those that do also support Belize Light. And there may not, uh, support some of the other flavors. Now, I know Fiori 3 is, is coming. In some extent, it's already here. Uh, the new Quartz theme is supposed to be deployed by all of the SaaS applications consistently and then provide a consistent look and feel across the Fiori launchpad for all of those applications. Uh, so when that comes, uh, I'm sure we'll go to Quartz uh, and to just maintain that visual consistency. And you know, staying standard also means you minimize the, the upgrade effort. Now, the only thing that we did deviate from the standard is, is the logo right there. So we put the Orica logo up just to remind people that where they work. Um, we, want, we didn't want the SAP logo there. But, you know, in hindsight, we shouldn't have done that. It, it caused us quite a lot of grief. Um, it seems fairly straightforward, but the, the theme editor implementation is, well, it's a bit bad rubbish maybe, um, it, it basically causes you to fork the whole theme and it creates Z copies of lots of different um, objects. It now means those objects can't be loaded from the CDN anymore. They have to be loaded from your server. So it reduces the benefit of the CDN implementation by, by a little bit. But the, the biggest problem is now you end up in very strange edge cases. So quite late in the project, we discovered a specific issue around cross uh, around course, so around cross-origin resource sharing from a browser that only happened if you're running SAP GUI from an embedded container inside your Fury Launchpad while being outside the Oracle network and accessing via the reverse proxy. Um, and it's, it's a limitation in the um, HTML specification for uh, HTML resource sharing. It basically means that the reverse proxy always requires authentication cookies to be sent. When a font is loaded, like an icon font, uh, fonts are never authenticated 
So authentication requests are never sent, uh, therefore it's blocked. So it's a slight edge case um, and it's entirely caused by the custom theme that we needed to create and the whole entire custom theme uh, that we needed to create just to put the logo in. So kind of very late in the project, we switched course a little bit and hacked the standard theme just to put the Oracle logo and then um, went, went back to standard and all of those problems disappeared. But even then, uh, the way that the theme editor is implemented right now makes this thing very painful. So in hindsight, it probably would have been easier to just accept the SAP logo on top um, or ask SAP very persistently for a better implementation. Um, talking about asking SAP, so we engaged SAP throughout the project quite a bit. Uh, we used max attention. We relied on, on the rig quite a lot for assistance and advice on how to do things or to help us get unstuck when we were running into a problem that we couldn't resolve. They often were able to point us to the right people uh, within SAP. We make quite a lot of use of customer engagement in initiatives. So if you follow the link, you'll probably find some that we raised. So please vote for them. Um, and, and obviously the community network as well. But it was still a pain. It was still painful. It was still a lot more work than anybody had anticipated at the beginning of the project. Um, it just needs a lot of effort and time. Uh, and that's something I definitely encourage you to plan for if you're going down this path. Um, you need effort in the design phase at the beginning when you're setting the foundational architecture and you're doing your planning, when you're doing your system uh, sizing, your system builds, uh, it needs effort in that space. It needs effort to educate functional consultants in many cases who have not really learned the Fury way of, of working yet. Um, it needs effort and, and care to shepherd your users through this, users that might have used SAP GUI for the last 10 years and are now being asked to use a browser UI. Um, so really a dedicated team that has the ability to focus their time on this and uh, who, who don't have to do other things, right? Whose sole task is to make the Fiori deployment work is probably best. They will need some level of basic skills, some security understanding, but I think empathy and patience, coming back to the design thinking life cycle, is still very, very important. There's still a lot of uh, teaching and educating seasoned SAP professionals in what Fiori is and what it's for and how it works, because not everybody has, uh, has been keeping up with this. And it's a lot more work than we expected. Um, and then there's still some persistent pain points with the solution. So sorting, I touched on briefly, um, you have to manually sort. There's no good way of sorting automatically to say, okay, I want all my tiles to be sorted alphabetically and that's it. Um, it's a very manual effort and the launchpad designer gets very, very slow when you have a very large number of tiles. So I think next time around, um, with knowing this upfront, we'll invest in some custom development here to make our life a little bit easier. Um, smart business tiles, the KPI tiles. There's a, a bit of a pain point here with this too, uh, because they, they're a little bit different with how they work compared to some of the other apps. So even if you're not authorized to use the, the services, they will still show up um, in your catalog. Um, yeah, it's a little bit difficult. So we'll probably put them into a separate group next time and a separate tab that just says KPI tiles and they're all there rather than mixing them at, at the start of each of the tabs as, I, as I've shown you. Um, the good news though is that uh, Fury Launchpad Content Manager is now here. Um, it's available on later versions of S4HANA. Uh, so I think you have to be on 1909, um, but it is available now. Uh, it wasn't available for us when we started, but um, that will make things a little bit simpler in some regards. It's not a GUI, um, so it's a GUI based transaction now rather than a Fury UI. So hopefully it can handle large amounts of data a little bit better as well. Um, and yeah, it was released. Um, it, it is available. So if you're on um, 752 version of SAP UI, then you, you have should seven have minutes it. Left. Um, you have seven minutes left, sorry. Thank you. Seven minutes. Uh, and um, another pain point for us was the, the process modeling and solution manager. Uh, so uh, as you might know, Fury apps uh, using semantic objects for um, the navigation and, and to identify them. 
and in Solution Manager, um, it's part of the key. Now, some apps use um, have multiple apps that use the same semantic object. Um, so then sometimes it's a little bit difficult to distinguish them and so on. Um, there's another pain point with Solution Manager. We had a few others, but I won't go into those now. Um, and then obviously some of the user experience of old apps is not necessarily as good as some of the newer apps. So SAP also has gone through a learning curve as they developed Fury applications. And um, newer applications support navigation between apps much better and carrying state between apps much better. Uh, some of the very older versions of apps are um, individual silos. Then you navigate from one to the other, not, not very nicely within the app, but by going out to the launch pad and back in, which can be a little bit difficult as well for users. Um, personalization uh, is, is a pain point to some extent. Uh, so we enabled personalization quite extensively and we were teaching our users how to personalize their launch pad. Um, but then, you know, it's, it's a very powerful tool. With that come some obligations of responsibility. So uh, it can be difficult to then support users if they've customized their launch pad quite a lot. Uh, and then they send you a screenshot and you're trying to reproduce the problem, but your screen looks nothing like their launch pad anymore. Um, you know, some of those uh, things can present some challenges and um, it, it's just difficult to push a consistent view um, to your users. If you have five people in a team that all have in the same job, then in our model, they all have the same launch pad design. Now, they all go and personalize their launch pads quite a lot. Uh, to suit their own personal preferences. Now, a sixth person joins that team, they get provisioned the default. And now their launch pad looks nothing like the launch pad of their other colleagues. So now to get this new person up to speed, it's a little bit more difficult. And there's no really good way of, um, you know, copying uh, like a default personalization and applying it to new users as well. So yeah, some challenges. So lessons learned, just to sum up, I, I'm running out of time. Uh, prepare and plan as much of this as you can. So prepare the technology architecture, prepare where your systems are going to be, uh, your deployment architecture for Launchpad, um, you know, network concerns around which location, which geography and, and jurisdiction do you put your systems relative to where you, your users are and so on. So there's quite a lot of planning that has to be done before you start activating stuff and then start diving in. If you're doing this at any number of scale and you want to tightly fit security model and uh, um, only show people the apps that they're actually authorized to use, then that's quite a bit of effort. And for that, try to create a, a factory, if possible, a repeatable process that you can churn through to generate security roles and Fury Launchpad configs that are combined and consistent. Um, build your own tools. So we built a few different tools. That report I quickly showed that links the uh, Solman process models with the org structure. That was a custom development. And there's a few other reports layered on top of this that help our folks to support users that phone up and complain about not having access to a particular tile or a particular transaction. Uh, so we have a report, for example, that says, oh, okay, so you want access to Fiori tile X. Uh, you, you plug in the, the name of the tile the name of the user, and it actually shows you whether they're supposed to have access to this or not. Um, and it just helps with uh, resolving security support cases too. Uh, keep your systems up to date. There's always performance improvements and functionality improvements and bug fixes coming along. Uh, so we tried uh, for a very long time to stay on the latest available version. And at one time we were then, we got to a stage in the project where we could no longer upgrade. But for as long as possible, try and stay on the latest. Don't do that N-1 stuff because then you always miss out on all those new bug fixes. And um, stay standard. Don't even change the logo if you can avoid it. OK, and that's it. Um, so my contact details, the slides are online. Uh, they will be shared as part of the conference. But you can also go to the URL on the screen to get the slides. And there are some further links at the back of the slide pack and all of the the hyperlinks work, so you can feel free to click through and, and read more. 
um, and right on time. Thank you very much, folks. Uh, there is three minutes left for just two questions from Michelle and Kirkuli. And Kirkuli said that when the HTTP2 comes to SAP Core Platform and all data provisioning, will it be uh, good? Yeah, so I, I don't know much whether I don't know much about SCP, uh, whether it supports HTTP2 yet or not. Um, it's possible that it doesn't support it yet. So we find quite a lot of software that doesn't support HTTP2 yet, uh, but SAP has now for, for some time, at least in the ABAP and Java world and, and with Web Dispatcher has supported it. So that's that's been a good progress. Um, I don't know about SCP, sorry. And the second one from Michelle, he asked that, did you have any troubles with long wait times with a person that could access almost anything? Uh, yes, 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 we do. So um, people on the project, uh, especially because uh, like somebody like me, I have access to all the tiles. So it takes uh, a good 45 seconds for the front end server to generate the, the menu for 1400 tiles and, and push that to the browser. So that is quite a long wait time. Uh, but most of the end users have fewer than 200, and um, th that's a better experience. It still takes a little bit of time, the first time you're accessing it. Then the second time you go back to the server, that menu structure has been cached on the server itself, and it doesn't have to be recalculated again. So the second load is, is vastly, vastly faster than the, than the first. The flip side is that any transport that gets imported into the Fury system that changes a catalog or any other change you make to a catalog or a, a group or a target mapping invalidates that entire cache for every user. So if you push a transport, it wipes out the cache for everyone. There's no really good solution for this. Uh, what we've done for this is just through training materials, set that expectation with our users that the first access of the day is most likely the slowest. And after that, it should be much faster. And that's on the, on the presumption that we really only will push transports to production once a day uh, rather than throughout. And uh, we're running out of time, but maybe you can uh, answer one last question. It's from sure. Stefanik. He asked, that, ah. did, you have, did you have any app built out of your element? Um, yes, so we built a lot, um, at least half of the custom apps that we built with Fury Elements, and that's been a really good experience, actually. So some of the custom apps, the not extremely complicated, but, but have a level of complexity to them. And the user experience and the, the performance and the snappiness is very, very good. So Fury Elements with uh, CDS views underneath it's a pretty good paradigm for custom built apps. Um, the, the performance of them has been really, really good. So I have only good things to say about that. And that's all. Thank you for all the uh, Thank you all for participating in this session and congrats to Manage for winning the raffle. And please perform in the live chat. All thank right. You. Thanks, Sam, for uh, facilitating as well. Thank you.